You're listening to the audiobook of Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, written by Federico Pistono, read by Ian R. Buck. Find the show notes for this chapter at thenexus.tv slash rsj16. Chapter 16. Work and Happiness. I feel like I am dwelling too much on this topic, but at the same time, I realize that I have barely scratched the surface of the study of happiness. A more thorough analysis would require a series of books on its own, and even then we would only have an incomplete picture. In this book, as I mentioned before, I decided to focus the attention on how happiness related to income, and more importantly, to employment, since this is the main topic of discussion. As we have seen, research shows that there is a correlation between income and general well-being, although fairly complicated and multifaceted. But it is unclear if there is a causation, and if so, which way does it go? We know that happier people are generally richer than the average, but we also know that happy people are less stressed, more sociable, more productive, and therefore more successful. So what is causing what exactly? The problem of reverse causation and selection bias is a serious one. People who are generally lonely and unhappy tend to be dismissed when looking for a job. They are more likely to become unemployed and stay unemployed. Then there is another question. Would people be just as happy if they had the same income but without having to work? Maybe it's not work itself that matters, but what it represents. Access. Access to a good house, medical care, vacations with their families, movies with friends. What if all those things were provided for? Would they be just as happy? The answer is a resounding no. You didn't expect that, did you? You thought I was going to say that if we gave people enough money or access to what they need, they wouldn't have to worry about petty little things and could finally concentrate on what really matters in their lives, which will make them happier. It turns out that just giving people money is not enough. We know that because people with full unemployment benefits were reportedly less happy than those who were employed with otherwise similar characteristics, controlling for other variables. Work does matter, after all. Unemployment plays such a big role in our happiness that it is hard to dismiss it with a few sentences. Many studies have found, in many countries and many time periods, that personally experiencing unemployment makes people very unhappy. Reference 1. In their groundbreaking study of Britain, Clark and Oswald summarized their result as follows. Joblessness depressed well-being more than any other single characteristic, including important negative ones such as divorce and separation. Reference 2. Great, Scott! More than divorce and separation? Is being employed such a powerful force in determining our general well-being? Apparently, it is. A while back, we pondered about the possibility of reverse causation due to a selection bias in the income determination. Could there be the same problem with employment? In other words, is unemployment causing unhappiness, or is it the other way around? Many studies with longitudinal data gathered before and after particular workers lost their jobs suggest that there is evidence that unhappy people do indeed perform poorly on the labor market but the main causation seems clearly to run from unemployment to unhappiness. Reference 3. Other studies in social psychology also come to similar conclusions. Reference 4. Let's stop for a moment and look at what we have discovered so far. Happiness is really complex, but we are beginning to understand it, and we certainly know more now than we did 20 years ago. We know that genetic, personal, stable partner, family, mental and physical health, good education, and social factors, democratic participation, sense of community, play a major role. We know that we are very bad at predicting our future happiness, as we tend to overestimate the effect that supposedly major events will have in the long term. 
We know that the memories of our experiences are distorted by our mind, and that we can be easily fooled. We know that we adapt to almost anything, with very few exceptions. Noise, cosmetic surgery, reference 5. We know that it is hard to step off the hedonic treadmill. We know that happiness is relative, as we tend to compare ourselves with those around us. We know that income does matter for our life satisfaction, in a log scale, but only up to a certain level for our emotional happiness, about $75,000. Most importantly, we know that being employed is crucial to our general well-being. If working is so important, and we are about to experience massive unemployment, then we are in for some very big problems. Unemployment leads to depression, anxiety, loss of self-esteem, and of personal control. Numerous studies have established that unemployed people are in worse mental and physical health than employed people, reference 6. As if that was not enough, they also have a greater tendency to consume large quantities of alcohol, their personal relationships are more strained, they have a higher death rate, and are also more likely to commit suicide. Just to put things into perspective, a one percentage point increase in state unemployment rates in the United States for 1972 to 1991 predicts an increase of suicides by 1.3%. Reference 7. Now, try to picture what a 25 or 30% unemployment rate is going to produce. It doesn't look pretty, does it? At this point, it would appear that we have no way out. On one side, we know that the profit-based market system requires an increase in productivity, which is achieved by automation. We have seen how that could play out. Technology advances exponentially, but our cultural adaptation does not. As a result, millions could be out of a job very soon, and only a few of them will be quick enough to learn new skills to find alternative employment. On the other side, we know that even if we find a way to provide for the unemployed, they will still live pretty miserable lives. What should we do? Should we get creative and find them meaningless jobs that serve the purpose of giving them the illusion of being helpful, even though they are really doing nothing productive? Should we stop automation by enforcing laws to prevent the collapse of the system? Bear in mind that this solution would only work for jobs in the public sector, because corporations know no boundaries and could not afford to operate at suboptimal levels of efficiency for long in the global market. So should the states, most of which are broke already, somehow try to hire and pay millions of superfluous workers in order to prevent widespread depression, suicides, and other collateral effects? Before I continue with my wild and ridiculous mental projections, it may be wiser to ask ourselves, why? Why does unemployment have such disastrous consequences? Why do people have to work in order to be happy? What is so special about working? Social norms greatly affect the subjective well-being of people, and this is particularly prominent among the unemployed. Reference 8. If the social norm is to have a job, those who do not feel alienated and ashamed are constantly plagued by a feeling of inferiority. We know how significant that is, given that we tend to always compare our achievements to those of others. Interestingly enough, this is also another unexpected consequence. The unemployed report to feel less miserable if they are surrounded by a majority of unemployed, as confirmed by many studies. Reference 9. Somewhat paradoxically, a high level of unemployment will be very detrimental to the people's well-being, but a significantly higher level would not be as bad. Before jumping to the conclusion that we should not worry too much about the future, consider the amount of pain and suffering that people will experience in between phases. Also, what kind of society would that be? Remember that the reason unemployed people's happiness rises is because 1. They adapt to their new situation, they lower their standards, their expectations, their dreams. 2. As it becomes the norm, the general culture of that society moves along with it. People lose purpose, and instead of being unhappy and miserable by themselves, they are slightly less unhappy and miserable together. 
I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to live in this kind of society. I shiver at the thought that this could represent the soon-to-be destiny of our species. There has to be another way. Section 1.1. Flow. Choose a job you love, and you will never have to work a day in your life. Confucius. The concept of flow was proposed by psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi and represents the mental state of operation in which a person in an activity is fully immersed in a feeling of energized focus, full involvement, and success in the process of the activity. It is a single-minded immersion, and it is perhaps the ultimate in harnessing emotions in the service of performing and learning. In flow, the emotions are not just contained and channeled, but positive, energized, and aligned with the task at hand. Reference 10. The me disappears during flow, and the I takes over. A rock climber in an early study of flow put it this way, You're so involved in what you're doing, you aren't thinking about yourself as separate from the immediate activity. You're no longer a participant observer, only a participant. You're moving in harmony with the something else you're part of. Flow is a subjective state that people report when they are completely involved in something, to the point of forgetting time, fatigue, and everything else but the activity itself. It's what we feel when we read a well-crafted novel, or play a good game of squash, or take part in a stimulating conversation. Mark Strand, former poet laureate of the United States, described this state while writing as follows. Reference 11. You're right in the work. You lose your sense of time. You're completely enraptured. You're completely caught up in what you are doing. When you are working on something and you are working well, you have the feeling that there's no other way of saying what you're saying. Social norms, adaptation, income, and relative comparison do not fully explain why work makes us live more fulfilling lives. We know this because studies have shown that the self-employed are happier even if they are working longer hours and or making less money. Reference 12. The same goes for voluntary workers, giving their hearts and minds to the nonprofit world. Reference 13. These people are not only working on something they enjoy doing, but also receive even more gratification through the act of helping others. Another interesting observation comes from looking at the number of hours worked annually by a person against the average life evaluation. Figure 1.1. Life evaluation against working hours in OECD countries, 2009. On the y-axis is percentage of people thriving. On the x-axis, the average annual hours actually worked per worker. Happiness data comes from the Gallup World Poll, 2005 to 2009, and working hours from the official OECD library. For an interactive version of the graph, click on the link in the show notes. As we can see from figure 1.1, references 14 and 15, people who live in countries where they work less are consistently happier than those who work longer hours. Take Denmark as an example. It comes out on every poll as one of the happiest places on earth, and as much as 82% of the population report to be thriving, well-rested, respected, free of pain, and intellectually engaged. Yet they only work 1,559 hours annually, 200 hours less than the average of all OECD countries. Compare it now with South Korea, where people work 2,232 hours, 473 hours more than the average and only 28% of them thrive. The same patterns can be observed all over. In countries where the work week is shorter, Sweden, Finland, Norway, the Netherlands, people thrive. In countries with more working hours, Greece, Poland, Hungary, Russia, Turkey, people are more miserable. There is an underlying principle at work that goes beyond society's expectations, status and class, or the income they generate. Independence, self-determination, freedom, the ability to follow our dreams, 
the feeling of creating positive change, being in a state of constant flow. This is what drives us. This is the difference between living by the day with no particular thrills and exploding with energy, living the days to their fullest, savoring every moment, making them exciting and indispensable. To make a difference, to transcend our condition, to help others, to create new things that nobody could ever dream of doing, to go where no one has gone before. Drive, flow, purpose. Work is merely an enabler of these conditions, not a requirement. You have been listening to the audiobook of Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, written by Federico Pistono, read by Ian R. Buck. This audiobook is a production of The Nexus TV, a network of technology-focused podcasts. Find our other shows at thenexus.tv. This audiobook is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 Unported License, so feel free to use any part of it as long as you link back to the original page. You do not use this for any commercial purposes, and you release your version under the same license. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological convergence. convergence. Tech news is dominated by big, bombastic personalities. Developers, 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 developers. Sometimes we're filled with awe. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes they throw shade. Toxic hell stew. Sometimes they inspire. Live, learn, and love. On our show, Nexus Special, we recap and analyze all the biggest announcements and keynote events in the tech world. Subscribe to Nexus Special in your favorite podcast player today. I got one more thing.